Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. In this episode, we're talking solely about Stranger Things, Season 4, Volume 1 and 2. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today for just this Stranger Things discussion is Troy Heinrichs. Uh, mostly just Volume 2. I don't remember what happened in Volume 1 because it was a whole, you know, three weeks ago. That's so long ago. Thankfully, we recorded that separate, so we already have that ready to go. That's plug and play. Exactly. You might have already heard that conversation. That's on you, but we're going to go through that again because we're going to take it Volumes 1 and Volumes 2, which I, Volume 1 was Episodes 1 through 7, and then Volume 2 was uh, 8 and 9, which is the real, that's where the, all the stuff culminated all the action happened. or we could just call it stranger things season four and then stranger things the movie part one and stranger things the movie part two it's pretty much all it was wasn't it i mean my god apparently Str- uh, netflix is just like whatever you need to do take our money just take it yeah do you feel like unlike other tv shows do you feel like you saw the 30 million dollars an episode that they ended up spending here in this season yeah i definitely think i did yeah yeah, the VFX department for sure. With the bats, the upside down, the the transition between the upside down and the right side up through the camper ceiling. I thought that was pretty cool and well done. The royalties for Masters of Puppets, Journey. <laughs> the royalties for Kate Bush, who's making bazillions of dollars now <laughs> on streaming records. Can you imagine that? I, I had never even heard that song before. I'm not knocking Kate Bush, but I had never, ever heard Running Up the Hill. I have never heard that, and I love 80s music. And... Now she's made, I think, a ba- you're right, a bazillion dollars. That's the actual total. That's the accounting. I mean, I remembered when I was 10, I made this really cool thing that resembled Gumby. I still haven't seen any of the royalties from that. <laughs> I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. All right, well, we're going to start with uh, Stranger Things Volume 1 and our thoughts on that. So if you might have already heard this part, because we did already kind of uh, allude to this portion of it. It was on part of our podcast a few weeks ago. We figured we'll put it all together for people that are Stranger Things fans. So here's our discussion on Volume 1, and we're going to come back after that, and we're going to talk about Volume 2. We have Elle off with Dr. Martin Brenner, who is definitely not dead. You surprised by this, Troy? Uh, no. Okay, she almost just seven episodes. Seven episodes, just so everybody's yeah, aware. Yeah, there's seven. It was weird. It was originally supposed to be five, and then four in the in the volume two, and then they changed it to seven. That was a weird change, but whatever. That's because there's four episodes in volume two. They just squished them into two episodes, <laughs> right? Um, so, the run times. Oh my gosh, the run times in this season are nuts. We'll talk about it. Hang on in a second. So after uh, she split. Angela's head open. She that's when she leaves with Dr. Martin Brenner to kind of get her powers back. And I gotta say, like, are there no parents in the skating rink? I don't understand why nobody's coming to L's, you know, benefit here. There was no adults there. It was like all high school kids, maybe a few college kids, but there was like no parental adults. But they had like the biggest bullying uh session since Carrie. And they can't even nobody can step forward and be like, hey, you know, it wasn't really her fault. Like she split that girl's head because she was kind of a bitch. Right? It was awesome. That's what it was. <laughs> uh, so the other characters, Mike and Will, are off searching their feelings as they're on the run with uh, Jonathan and his buddy. Dustin and Steve are back together. <clears throat> Love those two together. As Steve is babysitting again while Lucas, Nancy, and Robin join in trying to save Max and others from the new demon, Vecna, who has framed new favorite character, Eddie, for the murder of several teens. And... Man, I mean, I don't know where to start, but what, what do you think of this new... Se- well, first, let's talk about the runtime. So you don't like this new runtime thing for the season, right? Where they're basically almost movie length most of the time. Yeah, I mean, when you when you think about sitting down and watching a TV show, you have this like, you know, standard 44 minutes, possibly 55 minutes if you're watching HBO. But there's like a, 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 no, a time frame you're expecting in these things because maybe you want to get a workout in and you're going to watch mm-hmm. it while you ride your bike or do some yoga or whatever it is that you're end up or washing some dishes or what have you. Like there's an expectation of like how long I have to watch this. And when it's like 123, 116, 108, it, it's like just pick one time and stick with the consistency, I think would be helpful. Um, at the same time, tell a good story and still a story you want to tell. Cause I think that's also a very valid point. Um, the, the, the thing with this is that it was just like, at some point it's like, I got to pee, especially if you're doing the binge. <laughs> and it's just like the P the P breaks are like built in to be like at like the 120 mark. 
And that's like in the middle of episode three. So it's like, like I, I, I got to go. I got to pause it. I don't want to pause it. Okay. I, I will say I did feel like they were longer than they probably, I don't want to say needed to be because I never felt bored, man. Like I was interested the whole time. So, I mean, yeah, more Stranger Things isn't a bad thing. I just, I, to me, it's like you obviously have more episodes here. So why not just call it more episodes? Why, why does it have to be the number nine? I guess why not make it 11? There you go. There's a nice nod to your own show. <laughs> you know, it's a fair it's, statement. It's weird. It's weird how they're doing it. But uh, as to the show itself, what do you think, first of all, of the new villain Vecna? And especially that tie in where it's, is the was the kid's name Henry? Victor Creel's son was his name Henry, I think. Um, uh, I don't remember Victor Creel's son's name but off that's, the top of my head because I was so like, Vecna <gasps> is. what? <laughs> because you and I both thought pretty early that uh that the or maybe it was henry was the orderly's name maybe that was the name but just it's the same person yeah well they're all the same so somebody's a henry but the the orderly that's talking to 11 when she's trying to regain her powers or when she's reliving the past reliving and, regaining her yeah, powers reliving. i think that's the thing that's most confusing about this season a little bit is that a lot of what we see happen in the um, pre-season Rainbow one, pre-season one, it's actually pre-season one stuff. Even though you think you're watch, you're experiencing it as modern day, because you have to remember she goes into the deprivation tank. Right. So what you're seeing is actually a memory. You're not actually seeing current state. And so back in that pre-season one state, even though Eleven looks much older because she's obviously living it as her current self, going through that memory recall, um, she runs into this orderly, and orderly is telling her of like. Like there was a person that could do this trick and it was number one. And the minute he said that, I was like, oh, that dude's number one. Oh yeah. Same here. I'm like, okay, so yeah. he's number one. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. But I did not see the connection to where he's Victor Creel's son who actually murdered his whole family and, and tortured his own father. And then, you know, becomes Vecna. Like you really 11 made him happen. So now we've got a full circle to connect all these dots. And I thought that was a great reveal. Do you agree with that or hundred percent? I think it's what saves the season actually, because saves for a lot the of the season, season, what for, for a lot of the season, you're, you're kind of like thrown around a lot. I think is one of the things that's, that's kind of jarring this time around. You have uh, the group of people that moved on with um, uh, the buyers, right? They went out to California at the end of last season. And so you got, you know, 11, you got Jonathan, you got Will, um, and their mom and then Joyce. And it's just, they're all out in California. So you have like that group of people that are doing stuff. And then you have the, the kids that are now in high school. And so there's a jarring move there of like new high school people. You're trying to get like, like where, like where are they like trying to figure that part out? And it's like, Oh, okay. They're in high school. They're in Hawkins. You know, the, the gates have been closed. It's maybe a couple of years later. So they can get that, you know, the kids look older cause they all, you know, are 45 now by the time they're filming this. <laughs> They are. And then buying beer. you have the whole hopper sequence in Russia where that's all going down. So it jumps around between these three different parts. So it's not just solely focused on Hawkins and the upside down and the things that are happening. So you have to kind of like play with those three things for four to five episodes before the really starts to get going. It's really episode four that really goes, oh, okay, this is what the season is about. And really ropes you into the stakes that are at play. And then like four, five, six, seven, it's like watching a feature like movie, all four of those episodes. Those first three are a little bit slow, in my opinion, until you get to episode four. Man, I don't agree at all. I, I was, I love, minus the Russian subplot. I don't, the Russian stuff isn't working for me at all. I feel like that should have been half of an episode getting him back. Like, I just don't and, care. It's ridiculous how he survived. because it wasn't as a cool of a reveal. I think that's what it was. Because like, at the end of last season, you're like, oh, well, this just makes so much more sense. He like jumped into the upside down right. into the gate, came out on the other side. And then when it's revealed that all he did was get blown down to a floor below. Stupid. Stupid. That's stupid. Like just dumb. Wait. So she didn't think to just check, just to check real quick. Maybe he's on the ground. <laughs> maybe he hit the, maybe he hit the turf. And I'm trying to figure out like, how do you survive an explosion that just wiped out all those people that were there? But he survived. That's a dumb explanation. You're right. The upside down and coming out in Russia is what I think everybody kind of thought. And then you get the actual reveal and you're like, that's, that's absolutely ignorant. That's an ignorant. Especially answer. because you see the Demogorgon at the end of the season. Right. So you're like, well, clearly they had a gate in Russia or wherever the, the prison is, yep. Alaska or whatever it ends up being. 
um, you know, trying to pull that demigorgon through, like it would make more sense if the gate was in Russia versus capturing a demigorgon in Indiana and then flying it back home. I mean, come well, on. I mean, Alaska, you can see Russia from their house. They're in Russia. It's yeah. just, you know, Alaska is really close. It it's it's weird, man. It, it, that's a weird solution. I don't like that subplot at all. I still love the characters. You know, I think um, Hop is always a fun character to watch, and it's cool to see him kick some ass. And it's nice to see a couple Game of Thrones nods in there. But in the same token, none of that is really doing much for me. None of that. The, the kids are are where it's at. But all of the kid stuff, I'm enthralled by, especially Steve and Dustin. I want Steve to be the character that that outlives many of the kids honestly i just find steve to be the most riveting character and a goddamn well, hero of him because he's the babysitter he's a goddamn hero is what he is man he, yeah and he's gonna get nancy back i've been re-watching a bunch of stranger things kind of like i was getting ready for for this season and i like this season more than three by the way but it's amazing to me like how far that character has come how far he's developed and He's always the character, do you ever notice this, that he's always bitching about being the babysitter and stuff, but he's the first one to do the hero move. Yeah. Like, he doesn't blink. He just does it. And yeah, he's the first one to go through Watergate down at the bottom of the lake. He's the one that saves Max, really. The other kids are like, no, 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 wait. And he's like, no, 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 I'm calling it. She can sue me. And that's what gets him going on, on trying to figure out how to how to save Max, which I will agree with you. That is probably one of my, one of, if not, if not my favorite Stranger Things scene is um, where they save max from yeah Vecna. the cinematography the color schemes the music playing oh, the Kate bush song the, oh yeah i mean now here not to poo poo it by any stretch of the imagination but given max's upbringing you know her dad her dad you know leaving and then they're living in the chiller park like i feel like she's not really a kate bush type person for that to be like her favorite song i disagree I, if you really listen to the song i mean she's going through a lot of emotional turmoil and that's a really kind of almost emo song so i feel like it, it fit what she was going through because she really kind of blames herself and she's really regretting you can tell by the letter she's reading to billy that it's a it's a much more impactful moment and that's why that song keeps it's speaking to her and i think we all had that when we were kids right we just we had something that we were going through something and a song, you know, we were just talking about soundtracks. I had it happen so often where the song would be speaking to me in a moment of struggle. That's what I think she, I think they really, really illustrated that moment well. And I also think what I see so many people talking about, it's just great to show friendship and all that, which is great. But I also, it was a great mental health moment. I thought how they showed someone that was really just, uh, just really stopped caring about life and was forgetting that there's a lot of people that love her in her life. And she was forgetting that she wasn't seeing that she was so depressed. She wasn't seeing it anymore. And even though they were still right there trying, trying to do it. And it, it took her almost losing her life to really see that. I thought that was actually a beautiful moment. And Sadie Sink, I think is the most talented of the young actors on the show. For sure. For sure. So I, I love the direction it's going. I've been enthralled with it, except for Russia. Every time Russia happens, I'm like, that's a good, there's your pee break, Troy. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like it's also not as 80s on the nose as like the last seasons have been. I feel like it's it's kind of like left the 80s factor to it and just focus more on the story. Except for Mike's uh, outfit. Yeah. Yeah. His outfit's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty dated. Not going to lie. Um, the other things that I think that are really good inside of this se- this season, um, you get to see the, the town itself is kind of like, yeah, what's going on in our town? I'm kind of done with this. Like the like the town is finally starting to fight back against the the upside down and the things that are happening. So it's great to see the town get involved. Um, oh, and the the parents the are involved. Locations within the town and the parents are getting involved. I think it's good too. Yeah. How do you how do you feel about? I mean, so poor Eddie. <laughs> They're jumping, yeah. just jumping to poor Eddie. I mean, I love that character. I don't know about you, but I, I'm really starting to take a liking to him. And I, and I like the writing around the whole. Well, you know, Eddie might not be the one doing the killing, but he's like the the possessed channel for the devil's cult or whatever. Oh. They call it the Hellfire Club. That's a total eighties total eighties thing too. That was big yeah. in the eighties. So, like that that part was really good. I just I, I'm really more enthralled with the Eleven storyline as that was progressing and how she's like dealing with the stuff and reliving the memories and you like because because when you come into the season you're just like well what are they gonna do right like, like the mind flayer or one of his if it was not the mind flayer, it was at least one of his like really, really, really high up henchmen. Sure. 
and you know he's dead now at the end of the third season and the gates are sealed it's like how do you get back to the upside down so trying to figure out like how the upside down would crack open again i think is is a really great thing and then tying it into this explanation of how the big bad was created in the first place because they assumed that this person was like a uh, a lieutenant or a general for the mind flayer and that probably wasn't that at all. He's just possessed by the darkness as he gets sucked into the first gate that 11 opens, you know, before this show even starts. It's that original gate opening where Vecna actually gets created as he's getting sucked, sucked in. So is there anything you don't like about the season so far? Um, just how long the Russia thing's been taking. Because he you know, should have been out by now, right? I mean, it's well, seven freaking episodes, man. It, I mean, it makes sense. You're trying to build it up for the climax of the seventh episode. Where you and get them all together. This is this is where you know we're gonna like have the whole like he's gonna see Joyce and they're gonna embrace and it's like all the emotionalness is all saved up for the seventh episode. So you get it. So you gotta kind of drag it on, and then you gotta manufacture enough stuff for Joyce to have to do something. So the whole um, Yuri, um, the peanut butter smuggler storyline comes into play. You know, all of that stuff is just filler to make the emotional parts hit in episode seven versus episode three. Yeah, I'm I'm not a big fan of that. And I I feel like um there's maybe like one too many characters at this point. I, I can't put a finger on which character there's too many of, but I just feel like there's they've got too much going on. It's too busy to a degree. Well, because you have like the original crew, plus Max, plus Robin, plus Eddie, plus they go find Susie. And it's just like, okay, like how many more like people do we need to add to the ensemble? Can we get back to the original four at some point? Yeah. And it was weird how Susie keeps saving the world. <laughs> like, it just feels like that's a very convenient plot device at this point, like two seasons in a row. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I just feel like there's one character too many and I can't, I, I love all of them. I feel like Robin's a little shortchanged in this season where she was just adorable and riveting in every episode last that she was in last year. And this year, I feel like they're just trying to make her fit. Um, well, cause she's not, she's not a, you know, love interest for Steve. She's trying to be best friends with Nancy. Well, Nancy's trying to figure out her crap with Steve and, and Jonathan and Jonathan. And it's just like, yeah, Robin's is kind of left as like the, you know, Hey guys, include me. Yeah, and Will is is just over there kind of being uh there's a lot of people talking about his sexuality these days like is he gay or is he not? I mean, his mom alluded to him being gay in the first episode, so I just assumed he is. And why is that even a story point I, or a factor? I because don't know. I I feel like maybe he has a thing with with uh, Mike or he Mike. cares about Mike and there's relationship there and that there's probably some understanding that needs to happen before the end of the season or whatever. But maybe. I also think, you know, if he is he great, if he's not great, just tell me the Stranger Things story. Will's also the character that is the most, what do you want to call it, hampered because he was the boy that was missing for the entire first season. Sure. So you like don't like get to know Will until the end of the, the whole thing is done. And so really the whole team became a team without Will. So now that Will's in the picture in the second and third seasons, it's kind of like, it's awkward. I don't care about Will. Yeah, it's kind of awkward. It's yeah. ill-fitting. Can, can you just kidnap him again and just, just make him disappear? But I did I did like the the friend dynamic because that was really important. Like as kids get older, even if they were close uh, close knit friends, you do find wanting to be popular. So you kind of like Lucas, you know, he joins the basketball team and you want to go there. And they were also kind of jerks by not going to his game. It was like the one game that was really important to him that they show up and they didn't do it. They went and played played D and D together. You know, I mean, th those kinds of things, those, those fractions happen in close friendships. And I'm, I'm glad that they're kind of addressing them and it feels real, feels genuine. And the times when I thought Lucas might be doing the wrong thing for popularity's sake, he did the right thing, like putting, you know, leading them to Hop's cabin as opposed to where Eddie actually was and actually trying to warn them. I mean, he's still, he didn't change who he was, which is what I hate in, in shows when they do that, where now I'm with the popular crowd, so now I'm doing the, the the mean things, you know what I mean? Because that's not how real friends typically would do it. They, they'd still be real friends. They might just not be as open publicly as they used to be. Even though he looks the most different of the entire cast, you think so? Oh yeah. Like at I, first, I was like, "Who's this guy?" Him and, and Mike. Like, Mike looks wait, like is he's that Lucas, thirty-seven years old, and Lucas looks like. But he's it still looks like Mike. Lucas looks like Lucas, I think, except he's got muscles. No. Lucas does not look like Lucas. Lucas looks like he like aged up a lot compared <laughs> to everybody else. He definitely worked out a lot. Everybody else yeah. is still eating Cheez-Its and, and freaking SpaghettiOs. And he's over there. He's like, mm, protein shakes, baby. 
I'm an athlete. Great basketball win too. And I, I do, uh, what do you, what do you think about this, the satanic section of the town? Because D and D was seen as kind of like a, the devil's game back in the eighties. There's a long period where, where that was the case. And I know you, you kind of talked about it before, but how do you like, cause I can see this really turning the town against the kids. Yeah. It'll be an interesting thing that they can play off of for the final two of the season, right? When it comes back in July, because I think there's a movement there that the town being all riled up and going after everybody, you don't see it a lot of it because you end up seeing the cops get come to the lake, not the townspeople come to the lake to find the kids. So I, I think that's going to be something that's going to be really interesting as the rest of this plays out, as they figure it out. Okay. Once 11 comes back into the picture, once they have to actually go kill Vecna once and for all, you know, how the townspeople are going to mess that up. I think is going to be an interesting thing to play with. Okay. Anything you want to say more on stranger things before we call it? No. And actually the, I felt like, I don't know if it was just because it was seven episodes, even though all the episodes were longer, I felt like the binge this time around was easier than say season two or season three, like season two. Season, it just seemed like it was an all day affair. Like this didn't seem like an all day affair maybe because I broke it up over two days, but well, I think for me, I mean, you know, I'm such an eighties horror kid. So a lot of these really speak to me, but this is such a nightmare on Elm street vibe all the way oh, through, for sure. even with the Robert 100%. Anglin <laughs> popping up as Victor Creel which is a nice uh, nod. There's a lot of nods, obviously, to all kinds of 80s films, but to Nightmare on Elm Street in particular, because in the first episode, I'm like, so the villain is basically Freddy Krueger? That's what I'm getting? And yeah, and and except in this one, he can attack you when you're awake, which I I really love. And you and I were talking about, like one of my favorite moments, I think, in this this first batch is in episode seven, where where he gets Nancy. Because it was a it was a real play on audience expectations, really. And actually, uh, episode four was too, because so many people were talking about how emotional they got. I just assumed that Max was going to die in that episode, and she didn't. Thank God, and I love that how she came out. <laughs> Made me cry. But the Nancy episode. So, you know, they're 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 leaving the upside down. They're they're pulling out, which is very clever, by the way. Dustin, yeah, the, Dustin, the physics on it was awesome. Dustin is a genius. I think he should just be running the show at this point. I uh, love how he's like, yeah, when are you guys going to believe me? I'm like, always oh, right. Uh, that's like a little, little huge, right? So um, she, they're coming out and you just know it's going to be Steve, right? You just know because he's the guy that's going to go last. So there's no way he gets out of the upside down. He's going to be trapped there or get killed or something. And it's Nancy. And it's a real clever play. Even though it, it feels like we should have expected it, it's a very clever play. And that's the one that got me. That one really got me. Yeah, and the fact that it's preying off of your fears. Yeah. It's very much like a not only the Nightmare on Elm Street, but it's also an it factor as well. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Good call. It's like a good combo between it and uh which is still that Stephen King vibe that the show is always going for and also one of the best horror movies of all time. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now it's time for Stranger Things Volume 2. That's where all the magic happened. I mean, I think it's crazy that I I feel like so much more happened in these two episodes, which again, like you said, are four hours. So it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, four hours, if you did like 40-minute episodes, this would have been a whole season in itself. It's concluded now. You've got the answers you were looking for. You're wondering where things were going to go, where they were going to lead, what was going to happen with Vecna. Where, Where do you sit with this? I mean, I had the answers I needed at the end of volume one. Volume two was just, let's go kill the guy. It's a long time to kill that guy. It took it was a, a very, It was a very elaborate plan. I mean, there was like the people on the front lines, and then there was, you got to weaken it in Russia. And then there was the whole, um, we can just, you know, distract them by like doing voodoo magic in a salt dough ice tub in a pizza joint. It was mousetrap. That's what it was. Think about it. Was it was something. It was every, everybody playing Mousetrap in different parts of the country. Different parts of the world. The world. We're going to talk about the whole plan as a whole because I'm not convinced this was the smartest plan ever. I'm not convinced this was the, the way that they should have went, but I want to talk about that in a minute. First, just, just your overall thoughts. Season as a whole, now that you've concluded it. Fabulous. Fabulous. It was so good. Okay. It, it, makes, it makes season two look like dog do. Season two was just so not fun compared to this season. Is this your favorite? Well, season two had that crappy episode where they... The, yeah, when they introduced you to eight. Yeah, nobody needs that. I, I actually, yeah. we just revisited season two, and I, I didn't even watch that episode. <laughs> My wife said, didn't we skip an episode? I'm like, we sure did, but I'm not watching that again. I'm just sitting there going like, man, didn't couldn't have one just killed eight? 
I'm looking for the continuity area. Where's the retcon to get rid of eight altogether? Whatever it takes. So where do, where does it land for you in terms of the other season? Do you think it's no, better it's good. than first it was one? Really, really good. I like the I like the emotional impact of this the season. Um, I like the transitioning of the kids kind of growing into their own as they come into high school, even though they're like graduated from college in real life at this point. They are 45 years old. Yeah. Uh, all, of, all in all, I would say that this was thoroughly entertaining. I never felt, I always feel like panicked or rushed to like binge it all those first couple of mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. And like, I didn't feel super rushed to watch it, but it also just kind of like flowed naturally that even the first volume, I felt like I was watching like a long form movie and wasn't even concerned about runtime, wasn't concerned about what was happening or how long I'd been sitting on my ass for an entire day. I was just enjoying what I was watching as it was unfolding. I mean, especially episode four with the with the running up the hill with Max. I mean, just visually, cin- cin- cinematically, all of that was just fantastic. And then the whole, in this case, for this volume with the, Oh man, the metal song and just everything that was happening there and so good. Just really, really good TV. What amazed me is I don't think I've been as enthralled with Stranger Things since season one. I, I've liked all of them, but season one is the the last time I was just enthralled. In the zone, in the mood. I just I felt like it was very compelling storytelling. I felt like the visuals were just intriguing. I felt like all characters mattered. There was a path and a and a and an arc for everyone, which is really hard to do when you have, I think, what thirty six characters currently, and, and they still quite pull a, it off. Quite a few, quite a few. I mean, yeah, and, and even though a lot of it is like blatantly ripped off, right? I mean, this was the whole plan screams um, Dream Warriors, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three. Uh, <laughs> Very much so. Trying yeah. to suck, trying to suck Freddy out into the real in order to like actually kill Freddy for real. Um, you had the, you know, with number one's big reveal felt very much like Dollhouse and the fact that they had Alpha before they had Echo and how Alpha just kind of went nuts and schizo. Um, so a lot of this is like a retread of past concepts, but the way they interwove it and made it work, I thought was really fantastic. And, and I thought they really, they, they culminated in terms of they, they've peaked. Usually you get to a show and season four of any series is not the best one. Or it's not even in talks for the, for the best one. Yeah, three is usually where they peak, and then it's like, eh, we just yeah. have to do four to get to five to finish it. Yeah, and then we slowly but surely end on a, on a really down note. But here, I, I really feel like they have seen what works, what doesn't work, and they've done a very, very good job of, of bringing those things together. With the exception of, I do think the Russia storyline should have been solved. I think we talked about this in our volume one Two discussion. episodes. Yeah, two <laughs> episodes max. <laughs> max. <laughs> We broke out of the prison. Now we're breaking back into the prison because we don't have a way to actually fly to the States. And it's like, even the military stuff was kind of weak as well. You know, with the, um, the one dude who was trying to track down 11 to kill her. I mean, super great visuals in the desert when that all went down with the, with the, um, you know, the, the, the long shot that they had from mm-hmm. behind her as the helicopter crashes, like this just spectacular, but the whole military concept from a story perspective was a little weak. Yeah, I didn't need Papa back, but I'm glad he's dead finally. And and the Duffer brothers who were behind the show, they they cemented yes, he is he is dead, dead. Thank God. Well, and the fact that he had kind of had a redemption story too, when he actually did he un- I mean, would you undo- call that a redemption story? He was he's still a dick. Yeah, but he did undo the neck, the 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 compression necklace that was around her, the shock collar. Only because he, he knew did, he, he was did let dead. her go. It, yeah, it's, but it's like he he trapped a a, a dog. And trained it to be a lethal killer, and then he kept the freaking you know invisible fence around their neck, and then uh, I guess I'm gonna die here in a second. I guess now I'll let you go so you can fend for yourself. He didn't really let her go. He just didn't. He he saw that he had no other option at that point. Just saying, I, I'm not giving him the uh, pass that you're giving him. You're like, he, oh, he learned he a lesson. I'm like, nah, I didn't. I mean, he didn't have to undo it. Just saying, he could have just left it on, and then made the kids try to figure out how to get it off. He's totally a Scooby Doo villain. I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you meddling military. That's what I'm saying. Well, let's talk about some of the major arcs. We're not going to go and recap all of it because there's way too much going on. <laughs> but and there's a thousand podcasts that are devoted to Stranger Things that you can actually just they can go through piece by piece. But a lot of the the major story elements that happen, like Hopper and Joyce, they finally had their kiss, almost got it on too, and uh, Russia was finally resolved. I, I do want to point out Hopper. He's kind of kind of buff. 
kind of buff in these final two episodes. Like he's looking good. Except for that, you know, leathery bacon back that he's got from all the slashing. <laughs> Aside from that. But I mean, he took, he takes his shirt off and I'm like, all right, not bad. He, like he's been prepping for Joyce and the hopes that she returned. He wanted to make sure, you know, a, I'm hungry for some breadsticks, but B, when you see this, I'll still be hungry for breadsticks because I lost a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> and you're not thinking about Bob entirely. Right. Although she did think about Bob once. Well, I like that because I, I felt like that was her thinking, I'm not going to not do anything this time. Because remember when Bob died, she just stood there looking at him. And that's I, what I would have done. I would have been like, dude, that's a freaking like Ghostbusters dog eating you there. I'm not getting involved in that shit. I agree with that. I'm just, I mean, to be fair, that really it's Bob's fault. I just rewatched that. And it's a sad it's scene. It's totally Bob's fault. Bob hesitated. You just don't hesitate in that moment. He stood there. He's looking at her longingly and he pauses and he's just like, ah, oh, why not a writer? I mean, Joyce, you're so attractive. And then he gets killed and it's on him. Stupid, yeah. stupid Bob. Uh, but he does get to use the real Conan sword. I checked on this and David Harbour confirmed that is the real sword from Conan the Barbarian movies. That's cool. Isn't that cool? And there, there, I saw some people were like, where did that sword come from uh, earlier in the season <laughs> when the other prisoners were given weapons to fight the monsters off? They died. There's a sword. It was, it was left behind on the ground. It was yeah. just there. And that was a fantastic moment. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. The head lopped off. I was oh. like, yes. Now, so it was a stand up and cheer moment. Everything else with Yuri and all that didn't care at all about it. Yeah, I am not a fan of peanut butter before. I'm still not a fan of peanut butter later. <laughs> but I'm glad uh, Joyce and Hopper got together and they they had their kiss and she saves him. And even though he told her it was going to be different, he was totally going to be Bob there for a second. And she came and tasered that son of Can we Can we just talk about how the entire country is looking for them and they go back to Yuri's stronghold? like And nobody checked it? And nobody went there. Like, they were busy. They were being, and you know, there's an onslaught of uh, monsters coming after them, right? I suppose, but still, it's a big, Russia, big country. You'd think they could call somebody, right? Guys, can you can you check Yuri's compound <laughs> and uh, maybe right. send some peanut butter our way so we can have these attack dogs that are coming from another dimension, like lick that for a while instead of us, <laughs> <laughs> something. <laughs> uh, all right, I want to talk about the kids' plan because it. it there's parts of me where I love the execution because it made for some great cinematic material, right? But the actual plan, one, I guess they couldn't get a hold of Eleven, but me, I'm like, why did they have to do it right then? Because it just felt like such a risk for so many of them when they don't have Eleven, who has always been their their backup, their their major key component. It's like none of them put together, you know, yeah, we've won a bunch of times, but we only won because the one with the superpowers was handy. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like they just f- totally forgot that and put together this this master plan that I, I liked in its intricacy. But I also thought, how did you ever think this was going to work? I mean, I own. actually I bu- I bought the plan. I thought the plan was actually a solid plan. You know, you get up there. He's he's worried about Max, so he's not actually physically present when he's you know there. The the whole like trapping him and moving him and that whole I loved all of that. They just they forgot about the vines. Like you gotta gotta be thinking about the vines, but we will agree that once again, were it not for eleven, they would have all died. I don't know on this one. I d- just just think they had Steve and everyone trapped in the vines. Max was trapped at the snowball. The only reason that Max even got any kind of break or a reprieve, and everybody else got a chance to do anything, was because eleven showed up. And then I guess you got Joyce and Hopper that are distracting on another front. So that's, so that's my question. Like if Joyce and Hopper would have killed the Demigorgon and did the weakening thing, then all the, the, the dust or whatever was inside the one, would that have weakened him enough that 11 mm. wouldn't have necessarily have been needed? We never got to see that actually. Like, could they have done it on their own without it's 11? possible, right? I think so. It's possible, but still they only had, and they didn't, they only had a measure of success because they still kind of lost really. But they only right. survive because Eleven showed up via pizza ice bucket. <laughs> so, so weird. Ice bucket challenge. That's the only reason that she that they uh, technically survived once again. And I was kind of hoping that, honestly, they wouldn't need Eleven for this. I was really kind of hoping for that. I thought the kids could pull it off on their own. And obviously, they could not. They got closer. 
but they could not. If you think about it, because Eleven's the one that jumps in the mind and has the fight in the mind layer. The piggyback. The piggyback, exactly. So do you, th- you thought it was a smart plan, though, outside of that? You thought at least, I- hey, they're giving it a shot. But why did it have to be right then? Why, why couldn't it have been the next day? Maybe give it more time. Maybe see if Eleven will answer the phone. Because they've been calling him for days as it is already. Like, Max is just like, I got to get this done with. I'm sick of this song. <laughs> this song <laughs> Every time I play it, another 20 cents goes to Kate Bush and not me. <sighs> All right. Well, you know, it's still made for a really thrilling movie. I don't even want to call it an episode. Yeah, it was a movie. It was a full on event. Okay. So we're going to take some of the, the big moments here. Master of Puppets, Eddie's death. Did he actually buy time in your mind? Like some people I mean, are, are that saying point, that his death wasn't necessary. I, I guess, you know, he basically left, he escaped, he was clean, and then he went back to buy them more time. Do you feel like he bought more time? Uh, I would say no, because at that point they'd already been taken by the vines. So really, you know, it didn't buy any more time. However, he doesn't know that. So in his mind, he's thinking, oh man, I run away all the time. This is my chance to be a hero and take a stand. So I love the character move on it. Um, and yeah, when you, when that happens, unfortunately, death is inevitable when you're fighting an entire horde of bats. See, I think he did buy more time. Demi-Gorgon, Demi-Gorgon bats. Demi-bats. I think he did buy more time. Well, I mean, he gave him more time in the sense that he gave Max more time so that way Eleven could do the piggyback and get in, but they had no idea Eleven was coming. They didn't, but, so, but keep in did mind. Did he give him more time? Sure, but... But you've got... Steve, Nancy, and Robin are all strung up on the vines. If the bats would have, if he would have just left and escaped and the bats, their attention turned back to the house because by then they knew they were there, the bats could have devoured them before Eleven made her move. You know what I mean? So I, I do think in essence he did buy it's more possible, time. yeah. I could buy that. What'd you think about that Master of Puppets? I'm a, uh, I was a huge Metallica fan back in the day, man. So as soon as that guitar riff starts, I'm like, yes! I knew exactly what it was. Oh stoked yeah i mean song sequence was great the movement of the bats was great um the only thing was like when it's happening i mean you could tell it's very cgi'd in that sequence because of the compression in the stream from netflix so that was kind of the only bummer part it didn't look very it didn't look very fluid i would love to see that in a movie theater yeah i think in the movie theater it would have played much better oh that i just love that scene though man because it's just well, I love the song. So as soon as Master Puppets kicks in, finally, like Kate Bush took me a while to get into because I've never heard this song. Master Puppets, I I had that cassette, people. That's how long ago it was. I mean, Dustin looked a little dorky with his little head banging. I mean, no, he Dustin looked like all. all of us at that age <laughs> that heard that song for the first time. He looked That's exactly what, like we did. At uh, 26? What? <laughs> how old is he now? Oh, my God. I don't know. But, and the the real song, if you didn't know, is like eight minutes and 30 five seconds or something. I mean, it's a long song. It's glorious. All of it. Yeah, it is. Oh, just a master of metal is what that song is. So that was a great scene. And Joseph Quinn, the actor who played Eddie, I I give him a, I give him a lot of credit because one episode I was all in on Eddie. And I I think that's hard to do with this many characters that you're already rooting for. Yeah. From the jump when he was like, welcome to hellfire. I was like, that's a cool, that's a cool character. I like that character much better than Barb ever was right everybody was poor barb i'm like i really didn't yeah sorry barb didn't think much of you eddie he had that beautiful scene with chrissy and he starts this scene and he says i didn't even catch it the first time man didn't catch it the first time i don't know if you did but when he says chrissy this is for you i'm like yep "Uh, i have one um that was good and that tie-in i i should say i loved how it tied into dustin talking to his uncle at the end that was a pretty beautiful moment yeah, because the, the 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 two weeks later or whatever it was, two it days, kind of felt like two days later, two, whatever. It, it wasn't it wasn't necessary at all, except to like, oh, here's some loose ends that we totally forgot to do. But that sequence, the the conversation with his uncle, I thought that was class. That was really really good. I I respect that he had the conversation. I'm still part of me is if I'm the uncle, like so. Wait, what do you mean he was trying to save the town from what? Was he was he holding the <laughs> <laughs> the split together? I don't understand. I would want a little bit more clarification. But I yeah, the gr- were the ground opened up. Was he like holding two vines and trying to pull it back together like the Incredible Hulk? Like what's going on? <laughs> what exactly was he doing? But I had, I respect it because otherwise his poor uncle would be traumatized, like Barb's parents were right a couple of seasons back. I respect that he 
he he he grew from what happened with the Barb situation. I would say. Um, so a lot of people were worried about favorite character deaths. Me included, man. I, I've been telling everybody if Steve Harrington dies, I riot, and I and I meant it. Like that that would get me in the streets. But I I it really brought me to think. Like once I completed the episode. You know, maybe I'm just I'm listening to the internet too much because it's never really been that show where the main characters are are gonna die. Do you think they need more dire stakes where it's not just the person? That, it's not Billy. It's not Eddie. It's not Barb. It's not a non regular. They need a maybe real have, person to die. But, but I think they have to hold that right. Maybe that's what happens at the end of season five, right? Eleven in her final sacrifice ends up dying because she's <sighs> the only way she can save the world. And if you do, like, and if you mm. you kill off a major character before something like that happens, you know that takes away from that ultimate sacrifice at the end. I feel like that's, I don't want to say that's predictable, but I feel like that's the way it, it already seems like it's headed that way. So I would hope they would do something different rather than her have her sacrifice herself. I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I need a big character death to get me invested. Look what they did with Max. They didn't kill her off, but I'm still completely. I, I felt like they did. To a degree, you know, my heart broke. Well, she just did as die. Much. Well, um, you know what I mean. <laughs> four four bell tolls and the gates are open. She didn't stay dead. Well, no, because uh, Levin was still in her mind, so she was able to bring her mind back. Sort no, of. not her mind. She brought her body back. Her mind's still lost. That's but her mind part. is there in her subconscious. She's just not conscious. Conscious. Ah, uh, well, we'll come back to that because I don't know if that's completely true. Um. Okay, so we know from this episode that Eleven kind of caused all this in a way, because yeah. she she sent him there. So, do you feel like there's any part of us as fans that should, you know, blame the innocent little kid, or do we forgive her because she doesn't know her own power? No, we forgive her because she was being bullied by one. Like they were making fun of her because she was different. Like she just she didn't know how to control her emotions. She just needed some therapy, but. <laughs> you know, for what happened, it's like that's not her. That's not on her. Like she was trained to be a super super weapon. So it's on Papa. It's on Papa. Once again, he's not redeemed. I'm just saying. Bam. Case closed. Papa's a dick. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Papa's a dick. Did you like their mind fight between Eleven and Vecna? The the back. I love that because I'm. I keep watching them throw each other back and forth in the walls, and I'm like, you're in somebody's mind. I mean, this is. This is odd. I like yeah, it. I'm like, I'm odd. like, I'm like Max. You need an Excedrin? <laughs> yeah, somebody's got a headache. Did you like this? The whole mind layer flight? Yeah, it was cool. I mean, it's kind of what you expect to see, but at the same time, I think for the environment that they put it in, I thought it was pretty fantastic. Now for the season five finale, because Vecna is supposed to be the big bad going into season five. I don't. You don't. You want something that's tangible, right? Something physical, something in the real world where everybody can contribute to this fight. Yes, I would think. I don't really want another mind layer. Flight. Fight. Yeah, wasn't the mind flare in our real world though in season three, or were we in the upside down during the mall sequence? Uh, mind layer is what I'm talking about, but the mind the mind flare, which is the thing that he created or molded, was that was in the real world that that bounced into the real world, the mini one, yeah, right. So yeah, so I mean, we already technically had a real world scenario in season three. So do I need a real world scenario in season five? I don't know. I I, I kind of like this like three groups doing their own thing not understanding how it's connecting to the other because they were all like uh, what are you guys doing here it's like oh yeah like like yeah yeah like it was kind of funny how it all kind of wrapped up so i i like that concept of them trying to each do their own thing but yet still helping each other out because it takes all of us in order to win so now we just need a, a real takes all of us in order to win so we're all on the same playing field and not in another foreign country oh i uh, we have to stay in hawkins i didn't if if they go to Russia, I'm fast forward. I'm telling you right, right. now. <laughs> I don't need any more Russia. Bring Russia especially here. Be- especially because the Russia thing was so lame. Like, it wasn't it's exciting. Not because, like, like, Hopper should have gone through the rift into the upside down, survived in the upside down, and gone through the rift on the other side. That would have made that story so much cooler. But the fact that he just fell on a platform below, and then they, the Russians came and found him, it's like, no. That still no. bugs you, doesn't it? No, oh, it's stupid. Yeah. It was more dramatic to think like the whole time you're like, is he dead? Is he not dead? And then you get that glimpse that right at the end, you know, oh, and, and the American. And you're just like, yes, he totally jumped through the rift. That's the only way he could have gotten to Russia. And then it's not true. No, apparently Joyce didn't take the 30 seconds to go check and make sure he wasn't somewhere on the platform. Right. Because that's why it's <laughs> stupid. Because if he literally just fell down on the platform, like someone would have looked. A hundred percent. 
like I push the, I push the rubble off, I pat my coat, you know, I knock off the dust and like hopper, hopper. <laughs> Didn't even uh, check. Yeah, Apparently, uh, Joyce just saw the, the white light, and she's like, well, I guess he's gone. Yeah. Man, lost two guys in a, a couple episodes. That sucks. <laughs> uh, all right, Steve, Robin, and Nancy kicking Vecna's ass. A lot of people love that. I thought that was, once they got the chance to do it, it was pretty awesome. Except there is a moment where Steve's got an axe, and he's just standing there, and I'm like, why aren't you chopping heads, man? Why aren't you no chopping doubt. heads? Yeah. He's already like on fire, running around, just like cut each one of those vines down so he falls into place, and then he can take off his head. Something, God, do something. You got an axe. Why do you bring an axe and you don't use it? I don't get it. But anyway, it was a it was a really cool fight scene. I loved how they Molotov cocktailed his ass, and then in they, slow motion. <sighs> and a slow motion's overdone. It really is, but it really played here well. Really, yeah. really did. And Nancy got those shotgun blasts to the chest, and the I think the last one was to the face. It, you it, sawed off the shotgun. Why don't you shoot him in the head? <laughs> like I understand, uh, like yeah, hit him in the gut once, hit him in the shoulder once. It's reasons. like shoot him in the head, shoot him in the head. Reasons, and then he landed, and he pulled a Michael Myers. His body's gone. Dun dun dun. So that's back to my earlier question: Did he win? Did Vecna win? Oh, because I mean the. I mean, the, whole plan, the, the portal's the plan opened. was to kill him. Right. Yeah, but he didn't plan, die. He didn't die. The plan, though, doesn't. it wasn't a matter of if Vecna lived or died. The plan was open up the gates. And he did the four deaths in order to make that happen for the four tones on the clock. And because, unfortunately, Max did end up dying. ceasing to breathe, yep. dying. No, she died for a minute or whatever. Yeah. So, they yeah. found a loophole. Did Vecna win or did the Upside Down win? Like, who's really in charge? Because the Upside Down was there before Vecna showed up. He just organized it. He just organized it. Yeah. I honestly think, because I was um, I was talking to a, a buddy about this, and he was saying how, man, they kicked Vecna's ass, and da-da-da-da, and they, they came out ahead, they won. You know, they took, some, they took some hits, but they still won. And I'm like, I don't think they won. I think they lost. I think the plan actually failed. Uh, think yeah. about it. Has it has you, have you ever seen this, uh, read the book, or seen the movie? Or the the net the new movies that were in two parts called It, yeah. Twenty seven years from now, he's coming back to Hawkins. Okay, that's funny. Yeah, it is very reminiscent of that when you think about, it, isn't it? Son of a bitch. All of it. All of the the the, the reason why this show works is because just like season one, when you can say like this was like the Ghostbusters and mm-hmm. this was like E. T. and this was like you see those movies that we grew up with as kids. It's like you can see those exact same things here. The fact that Vecna lived is Michael Myers, Pennywise. Freddy, all of that stuff wrapped up into one bad guy. Well, in, in my mind, you don't win when the villain is still able to hurt you, right? You've just, right. you've just, you saved some time. You've, you've bought, bought some, some bought time. some time. That's the word, phrase I'm looking for. Because the portals did open, so now Vecna, once he regains his his energy, re- regains his health or whatever. He can come back full force. I mean, he's just basically wounded. He's licking his wound somewhere, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the portals are they're opened. Like, they're downtown at the church. Like, does nobody else see the giant red lava looking thing that's in the middle of the ground? It very like, much it seemed like, like nobody like, was aware that the portals existed. <laughs> the people of Hawkins are very stupid because they just look past a lot of things. They just let things Apparently. slide. All these things that are happening around this mysterious government facility. Nah, it's nothing there. It's all nonsense. Just get back to our 80s life watching Robert Stack on television. Um, I I think the portals seem to be like they showed they were glowing red and everything else to begin with. But two days later, they just looked like maybe it's because Vecna had been wounded. So it kind of they're not closed, but they're all but they're also not open. You know what I mean? They're kind of they're there. So they're not, I don't think they're glowing red anymore. They're just separations in, in the world. But I got to think that those portals are open. So eventually monsters are going to start rising up or we're going to start going down. Oh, well, yeah. We saw, the, we saw the quote unquote snow at the end. So mm-hmm. there's definitely trouble of brewing. The, the uh, upside down has arrived. It is on our plane now because now we're getting It's not. What do you call that? It's not really snow. It's more like debris. Dust? Yeah. Dandelions? Cottonwood? It's pollen. It's upside down pollen. Something. But it's here. Yeah. Okay, so Max gets mutilated, which I thought, wow, ballsy. 
I mean, I thought for sure she was out, and then her limb starts snapping, and then I thought for sure she's got to be dead, which I guess she did technically. Brutal scene, though. Horribly brutal scene. And that's all Jason's fault, so I was glad when he got, um, whatever, he melted in half. <laughs> that was great. Cause that is emotional, too, because you're like, even though you think that he, you know, Eleven's in there, Eleven can save her, Eleven can bring her back out, mm-hmm. still got the teary-eyed going I did. when she passed. Like, the minute those bells started tolling, you were like, no, she can't be dead. Why is she dead? Kudos to both the actors, too, because Lucas really brought it. He's He's been one of those characters where I think he's been underserved for several years. The first season, I didn't think he was a very oh, yeah. good actor. But he's really grown as an actor, and he really crushed that scene. He really did. So did Sadie Sink. I mean, I think they're both, they both did a great job. Oh, where Lucas is, Erica, help. I'm like, oh, my God, I need this poor kid. <laughs> so what do you think is going on with her? Because... Either my here's what I think. The easy answer is Vecna is in her mind, which is why uh, Eleven can't find her, or Max's mind is with Vecna because you know he absorbs their minds or whatever their memories and stuff. So, do you think they're gonna have to fight I for I, Max's mind? No, I think Max's mind and Vecna's are separated. Vecna's just Vecna. I think Max's mind is actually inside of Eleven, hmm. and until Eleven can figure out that. And then pull it back out of her to get it back into Max. That's why Max is in a coma. But Eleven like went Max in there. Max in Eleven, basically. And you just think Eleven doesn't know that? Right. But once once she goes into her mind, now our minds are, are fused in the same plane. So just like she could piggyback in, Max could piggyback out. Oh. That's an interesting concept. That's not one I've heard. And now you're going to stick to it because you just probably pulled that out of your ass, right? Or just like I what? sure did. <laughs> I like that though. I, that seems pretty. I mean, they call the episode the piggyback, so yeah, that would be an interesting twist. We're where, assuming that it's the piggyback to get in, but it was really the piggyback to get out. I like it. I like that. It's call just, me Duffer just, Brothers. I'm here. <laughs> I need that Kate Bush money. God, we all need that Kate Bush. She got millions, man. Off people streaming it on Spotify. She's probably the only person, the only artist on Spotify who's got millions <laughs> this year. <laughs> Everybody else gets like thirty cents a, a year. Uh, okay, so. You know, there's been a lot of talk about is Will gay or is, is Will not gay. I mean, what? they've been I've been alluding to it since the first season, the very first episode. They talked. You about don't it. say. Yeah. You don't say. Uh huh. And people are still debating this, but he had kind of two coming out moments. One with Mike, where he's obviously talking to him about, about his, himself, about himself, <laughs> trying to make him feel better about Eleven. Beautiful moment, by the way. I, I think. He did a great job. And then his moment with his brother where his brother is telling him, hey, no matter what, I'm still going to be here for you. No matter what, like I, I've got your back. Because he was just looking at Mike and Eleven getting all googly eyed and going like, oh, I wish I had that. Yeah. So what do you think about that? I mean, there are some people that just he, they need him to say he's gay and I don't need that. I, I We know. I mean, I if think you this don't is good. know after this season, like stop watching the show. Yeah. You're not paying attention. Like, you're not paying attention. <laughs> But I ask you as a, you're an avid TV fan. I don't need him to say it. No. Do you? No, not at all. I mean, there was even a moment where it was like 11 and Max. It's like, maybe there's something between 11 and Max. It's possible. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, and I, and I get, this is the 80s, right? It was a lot harder back then to come out. It, exactly. Totally different world. And the That's same, why you don't say it out loud because it's the 80s. I think you just need his friends to acknowledge they understand. And in the way that they do. It doesn't have to be, oh, you are gay. Okay, we support you. I don't want it like that. It's not an after school special. Just like friends do, where they just they just know and you can see it in the way that they present it. Yep. And Mike finally figures out that he is the dumbest friend of all time that he hasn't put this together. Well, I mean, as much of a leader of the group that he is, the heart. Yeah, he just doesn't have a good brain. <laughs> <laughs> the heart. He's the heart of the group. As long as it's Eleven, because it seems like that's what he's always chasing. I mean, he was chasing Will for a while, and then Eleven came along. He's like, you know, Will, hang tight. All right, there's a new girl in the <laughs> in the room. I got to deal with this. I got a little yeah, so Yeah, sort of the Vine Flare, which we found out is now Vecna, is literally in uh, Will's neck hair. It's like, I got to go Mac with my girlfriend. Poor Will. <laughs> oh, thank they God need Will to be... A, they need Will. They need to come back to the fact that Will has this connection to the Upside Down from season one. And, like, make Will be the badass of season five. Otherwise, Will's yeah. character has just been completely useless, I in agree. my opinion. He's kind of been wasted. Absolutely wasted. Yeah. This is the, 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 the this is the, um, I'm totally going to lose my Game of Thrones cred. Um, 
Brandon, not Brandon Stark. Bran. Bran. Yeah. It's like Will's got to be like Bran and just become like the badass of the final season. Hopefully they give him more than just two, two minutes at the end to become that badass. I mean, actually. Even if they only gets two minutes at the end, at least it'll like make his character worth something because right now his character isn't worth anything at this point. Well, I don't say that. I mean, he's the driving okay. force of the first couple seasons, really. And then they just forgot him in three and four. He didn't have much to do except pine for Mike, which is, you know, he, he's capable of a lot more, obviously, by his performances and two pivotal scenes. So let's give him more to do. And clearly he bonded with Eleven while they were moving in California. Sure. So there's like that relationship that should be explored. Sure. Obviously, you got plenty of time to explore all these relationships. God, Netflix is just saying, take whatever time you need. Make 14 movies. We don't care. It's whatever. Uh, Robin also looks like she found a little love at the end. Could care less. <laughs> really? <laughs> could I think, or couldn't? I think, I think the Robin and Nancy relationship was a lot of fun. Like that, 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 that whole, you know, going to the uh, asylum, seeing Robert England. I thought like the, their back and forth and banter, I thought was much more interesting than her having a love interest. It was like, really, everybody's got to be in a high school musical at this point. Cause it's a, Honestly, I'm so sick of the love triangle between Steve and Nancy and Jonathan. I'd be okay if this Robin and Nancy just went off with each other and just said, you know what? I think we work out better. Oh, no. Steve and Nancy have to end up together. Jonathan's a stoner loser now. They really Nancy knows. They Nancy's, really, Nancy's like, Steve, the only reason we're together is that I'm not having six kids. You know, dial it back. Zero, maybe one. I'll do the RV thing with you. I'll, I'll bend. But six kids... Yeah, that's where I draw the line. Hey, Jonathan, what's up? Okay, I will agree with you that I don't care. It's not that I don't care. I I like that Robin found a relationship because that was something she was struggling with the whole season. But a a really cool moment of that was Steve, even though he knows he just thought he had a shot with Nancy and lost her again to Jonathan, that he's still happy for her. And I feel like that was a great moment, not because it should be all about Steve. You know, it should be about Robin and everything. It's just... The evolution of his character, because, you know, in the very first season, he had moments of selfishness, and now he's really become this fully-fledged, selfless guy. And I think that's that's beautiful. Like, he's got the mo- some of the better, best character development in the entire series. Yeah, you would say that even though it was purely a friend moment, you could also sure. say it was almost like a dad moment, where he was like a proud papa. Look <laughs> at my kids that I got to watch all the time, growing up and yeah. getting girlfriends. Yeah, and, and I do wonder how... Because Eddie made sure to stress to Steve that, you know, Dustin worships him and, and, you know, just looks up to him and everything else. And I wonder if that's going to play a pivotal moment because, you know, Dustin lost Eddie. If in the season five, if it's going to be a situation where Dustin's not going to want Steve to go be a hero because he doesn't want to lose him too, you know, have a, a pretty hard Something you can write towards for sure. It's definitely there. Oh my God. It's got to be there, right? It's got to be. Gotta be. Anything else about this season that uh, you want to you want to mention, or especially the last two episodes, movies? I dig it. Like, you know, maybe not two hours, twenty two minutes, but you know that that hour ninety, you know, the hour and a half, ninety minutes. That felt like a good pace of show. I like that they're not beholden to the TV typical format. format. Yeah. yeah, I just make I, an I episode, that. make a story, make a whatever you want to call it these days. I didn't feel like it was ever being drug out. No, not at all. So, my God. Could have used the, pot, could have used the potty break, but, you know. <laughs> Get a pause button. That's the beauty of watching at home. It's what everybody always says. Yeah, but, I mean, just like James Cameron. Like, dude, like, you don't understand. Like, you get up and go to the bathroom. It, you lose the experience. You got to get back in the thing. It's like, it's like when you're having sex and the dog barks. It's like, you just don't, you got to start all over again. I don't know about you, but the dog doesn't distract me that much. And just like, as long as somebody's breaking in the house, I can keep going. Well, you don't know. The dog's like, arr, 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 arr. you're like, holy shit, what's happening? Did someone just come home? Did maybe, I lock the door? Maybe the dog's applauding in his his own way. Could be. That's what it's all about. Uh, that, that's what it's like to go to the to the bathroom in the middle of of a picture. Like you you your your brain is enthralled in the story and the environment. You cannot turn that off and be like, all right, I'm just gonna get some Cheetos now. And then like come back upstairs and get back in that same groove. It's going to take like 10 minutes. I get what you're saying. Especially if you can't pause it in the theater. Avatar 2. You're, you're speaking to James Cameron's recent quote where he's like, Avatar 2, I don't want to hear you bitching because you guys binge all the time. So I don't want to hear you bitching about how long this movie is. That one? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I binge all the time because I can pause it and go to the bathroom. 
But then apparently it takes you 10 minutes to get back into it. It does. So don't do that. So just, if you're going to have a three hour movie, just build in an intermission. Well, back to stranger things. <laughs> I, I, I build in an intermission in that two hours and 22 minutes. <laughs> uh, well, that's what an episode would be, right? That's what an, yeah. a typical episode break would be. But I like that. I like this. This didn't, I love that. It felt like a movie. It felt like an event. And it did. I, I didn't feel like it really had a specific moment where, yeah, make that an episode break and then we'll come back. Right before the plan started, they could probably cut it there. Maybe. Or maybe the epilogue. I mean, the last 20 minutes wasn't that long enough to take a pee break. It's like, oh, it's only 20 minutes. I can sit it out. I needed it like I needed it after the helicopter blew up, after the military stuff was done. And Eleven was back with the surfer boys. I think that two days later was actually like 40 minutes. I mean, it was a good chunk. It was long. It was long. It was definitely long. That's yeah. for sure. I was like, oh my God, it's not over yet. It was long. But you do get all the reuniting at the end. So I feel like we're ready to go. And the Duffer Brothers have said that it's going to be very much a, um, you know. Winner take all. It hit the ground running, too. So they're, they're not going to be doing a whole lot of scattered all over the world. They're going to be in Hawkins for season five. Now, and then we also got the reuniting of of L and Hopper, which was really, really sweet. Yeah. Totally forgot about that. I left the door open, just like you said. <laughs> so sweet. And of course, Will's hairy neck is going ah, crazy. Oh, and Hopper hugging Mike. That was a very sweet moment, too. It was. That was very nice. Like, hey, kid, I'm 20 pounds lighter and you're 30 <laughs> years older. <laughs> so where do we where do we go from here? Because the Duffer Brothers have said that season five will keep the characters in Hawkins. It will be a final battle type season. Is there anything you really want to see? I'll talk about something that I saw. But first, is there anything that you really want to see? I don't even know what you could do at this point because the military lost. I mean, this would be a thing where it's like the military wants to control Hawkins because the gates are now open from a from a world power domination thing. So sciencey stuff, it doesn't really apply anymore. You know, I think this is just kids being kids and going on an adventure. Well, one of the big tricks they're going to have to ride around, right, is now that the government's involved and they're on site. How are the kids going to have much of an effect here? Right. Outside of 11. I mean, it's going to be really hard for the kids to have much of an effect. Because before it was just a military lab. Now you have the United States government. And they're not going to give up this portal to another dimension anytime soon. That I can see. That I can see. Exactly. So that'll be uh, quite quite interesting. Uh, I did want to mention that if you notice the the picture that Will drew, where he was totally lying about L telling him to draw this thing, it seemed to me anyway, that... The dragon, right. like multi-headed dragon, I think it had three heads in the painting, but there's a, in Dungeons and Dragons, there's a Tiamat, which is a supremely strong and powerful five-headed dra- draconic goddess in the Dungeons and Dragons game. And it's basically a, a goddess from Mesopotamian Potamian, uh, mythology. She's the queen and mother of evil dragons and a member of the default pantheon of Dungeons and Dragons gods, but also has connections to Vecna. So I think that might be a foreshadowing of a battle to come in season five. We might get one of Vecna's army is one of these Tiamat. I would agree. Monsters. And it would fit into the whole, like whatever the bad, bad guy is for the season. It's whatever they were playing Dungeons and Dragons in the first episode. Oh, just bring it full circle. Yep. <sighs> I gotta go back and rewatch that. I just literally rewatched it. And I gotta rewatch yeah, it. Yeah, Vec- remember they're they're in the Hellfire game. They were playing with Vecna was the was the name of the 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 bad guy in the Dungeons and Dragons game. This season or the first season? This season. This season. Okay. Every season it's a different thing. Right. It's a different D and D character. Yeah. Sure. So I, I think I think it makes sense. And Vecna is going to be the big the big bad, but I think there's going to be a lot more monsters they have to battle, and they're going to have to get Max back and a lot of other things that they're going to have to deal with. And of course, Will's going to have more awkward conversations that people don't seem to understand. Right. Will's going to start to talk to his mom and his mom's just going to go, I know, honey. And that'll be it. Because <laughs> Joyce always knows. She has always got it figured out. And so does the rest of the people watching the show. <laughs> they do. Figured there's it a- out in season one. Okay. <laughs> and you know, there's a spinoff coming. The Duffers have, have said that there is a spinoff coming and it's not going to be anything you think. And so far, only Finn Wolfhard has deciphered what that spinoff would be as long as it isn't about eight i'll yeah. watch it yeah they said it's not going to be like a steve and dustin team up it's not going to be another number nothing like that it'll be something you wouldn't expect which so keep that in mind 
That's probably a long way away, but it's coming. Okay, that's it. Anything else on Stranger Things before we close it out? Uh, yeah, just uh, enjoy Netflix and whatever comes next because <laughs> this is Netflix's problem. Like we all talked about Stranger Things for four days, and now there's nothing to talk about anymore. <laughs> Shit. They have content. They've got nothing but content. Just nothing people want to watch. Yeah, yeah, so they don't have Stranger Things. I guess we're going to rewatch have Ozark. It. It's, it's, a, it's, end, it's the end of a Netflix era. That's true when you think about it. They need some more original IP. Or yeah. spinoffs. Lots of spinoffs. Stranger Things spinoff. Ozark spinoff. Lincoln Lawyer spinoff. It'll be like the, the Hyundai Lawyer. Something like that. Well, they could have had an Ozark spinoff, and they ruined that when they took out who they took out at the end of the year. Don't get me started, man. Just don't do it. Okay, everybody, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, we'll be back next week. So remember, the next time you go to a theater, buy popcorn. Or watch a full two-hour movie on your couch. <laughs> and make popcorn. Or make Eleven make you popcorn. She can do that, right? Ooh, she can totally do that. Apparently, she can resuscitate people. I didn't know. That. That's a new thing. I'm sure Bob would have appreciated that. <laughs> Somewhere, Sean Astin's like, nobody could have written this into my character? <laughs>